Today we're going to be in Revelation chapter 20. This chapter has caused great controversy. I hope um, that I can bring some uh, helpful insight here, although I don't hope to solve the controversy. It is obvious to me that chapter 20 is related to chapter 19 and to 21 and 22. Personally, I see it as being more in chronological order, although some of the book has not been in chronological order, and I must admit that's more a presupposition than an exegetical truth. Chapter 20, the reason I think it's caused so much controversy is because it uh, initiates two new truths that seem to contradict other passages of Scripture. Now, those two truths introduced uniquely in Revelation 20, and in my opinion, not anywhere else, are a thousand-year temporal reign of Christ and a uh, two-stage resurrection. Now, of course, that seems to contradict an eternal reign of Christ that we've seen from other passages and that judgment and resurrection are simultaneous. Another reason that this has caused so much trouble is because there are some very ambiguous elements here. Let me give you just a few. I kind of listed some. The area and the extent of Satan's binding, number two, how many groups there are in verse four and exactly who is involved in the first resurrection, number three, the who, where, what concerning the reign of Christ mentioned in verse six, where the nations come from in verse seven, because I thought they were all destroyed in the last chapter with the beast, the meaning and location of the beloved city, and who is involved in the white throne judgment, and how does this relate to Matthew 25, 31 and following. It must be emphasized that the millennial reign is not the same, not the same as the kingdom of God. It is also not the same as the new age, or the millennial kingdom, the messianic age, is different from that, because these other two seem to be eternal, and this one is limited in time. Now, I want to say right up front that I believe that this is the inspired, authoritative word of God. I believe that God was trying to communicate truth to us through this passage. But the real question is, what is the content and purpose of this revelatory section. Is it to give us specific chronological details about the end of the age, or is it to give us spiritual insight into the spiritual struggle of every age? And finally, I want to say, the amount of writing and controversy this chapter has caused far outweighs its place in the scheme of John's overall uh, writing. Uh, the thousand-year reign has borne too much weight. It is not the major emphasis of the book of the Revelation. Neither is the second coming of Christ. It is the sovereignty of God in human history. Now, both of these are true, and I believe revelatory, but they are not, how should I put it, uh, irreducible minimums of the Christian faith. And so we should not treat them as that. Um, I certainly believe in a personal, uh, physical, bodily return of Jesus Christ, but I'm not sure the 19th chapter of Revelation is the only information we have about that. There are some other passages. Um, I certainly believe that there's a New Testament emphasis, the saints will reign with Christ. But I'm not sure that is fulfilled completely in this concept of the thousand-year reign, which seems to involve only the martyrs. Now let's look at the text uh, as to what John meant to say, and then we're going to have to answer what did he mean. Now what he tended to say tends to back up pre-millennialism. What he meant to say um, seems, in my opinion, to back up some of the tenets of amillennialism. So if you're interested in where I am, <laughs> I tend to be somewhere between historical pre and ah. And I am a post-tribulationist, which means I think the church will go through the tribulation period. Uh, I think the commentators that have helped me most here have been George Ladd, uh, Alan Johnson, 
um, Leon Morris, and the New International Commentary's author, Mouch. They have been very helpful, and I see elements of truth. All human systems that have interpreted this chapter, all of them have some elements of truth and some elements of error. All of us have problems in this chapter, all commentators. Now, then I saw an angel coming down out of heaven with a key to the abyss. Sounds much like the angel back in chapter 9, verse 1. The key to the, to the uh, death and hell was seen on Christ's belt in chapter 1, verse 18. Isn't it funny that Satan is overthrown by an unnamed angel? <laughs> God doesn't even dirty his hands with him himself. Now, the key to the abyss means the authority over the abyss. We've seen the abyss earlier back in chapter 9. It's kind of a holding place of the evil spiritual elements. Uh, the demonic horde of chapter 9 comes out of the abyss. Uh, that's where Satan is bound here, the abyss. In Luke 8.31, it's where the, the demons that Jesus confronted in the Gadarene demoniac uh, were afraid to go. And so it's obviously a holding place of evil spirits. I think much like the concept of Tartarus found in 2 Peter 2.4. With a great chain in his hand. Now, of course, this idea of chaining spiritual beings is not something new uh, in apocalyptic Judaism anyway. We see it in the book of Enoch, chapter 88, verse 1, that an angel is bound hand and foot and thrown into a deep shaft. And so that's something of a parallel here. Now, it's important to me, there are three doublets. There's a key to the abyss, but not only is Satan put in the abyss, but he is chained, double emphasis. And then in just a minute, the door is going to be closed and it's going to be sealed. So four aspects of his limiting are mentioned, which seems to me to kind of overthrow the amillennial view that he's just chained in one area, deceiving the nations. Uh, so I don't think this can fit between the, uh, the resurrection of Christ and the second coming. It seems that he's completely chained, completely cut off, although there's some difference of interpretation. Now, that's where it says, and he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent. Now, the dragon, the serpent, is going back to chapter 12, particularly verse 9, where these titles are used for him, that, who is the devil and Satan. All four titles are used in, in Revelation 12, 9. Now, and, brought, and bound him for a thousand years. This is the only place in all the scripture that a thousand years is mentioned. Because of the obvious use of symbolic numbers, to me, the thousand years is not a literal thousand years. I'm not denying it's possible for an earthly reign of Christ. I'm just saying I think the thousand years is a symbol for a long, complete period. Now, the reason for that is that the thou a thousand is used as a symbolic number several times in the Bible. Deuteronomy 7, 9, 1 Chronicles 16, 15, Job 9, 3, Psalms 50, verse 10, Psalms 105, 8, and 1 Peter 3, 8 are all thousand years used in a symbolic nature. The background of John's use may be the old idea of seven days of creation. Uh, you got 6,000 years of literal history and a 7,000-year Sabbath. Uh, I mean, a seventh thousand or one thousand year Sabbath. And that may be the background. We're just not sure. This is the only place, this concept, though, of a, um, that kind of numbered reign uh, exists. So I think because there's other symbols, because it's in a book that is obviously symbolic, we've, we've interpreted much of this as being symbol. Uh, also because there's no parallel, though George Ladd thinks that 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 29 is a parallel. Um, I, I don't know if I buy that or not. And because Jesus said that his kingdom is not a temporal earthly kingdom when he was talking to Pilate in John 19, 36, I tend to make the thousand years symbolic. So I'm a non-millennialist, but I don't disagree there could be an earthly reign of Christ. I just don't think the thousand years is literal, surrounded by symbolic elements. One guy, he said everything is symbolic up to chapter uh, 20, and then it becomes literal. Well, that's pretty presuppositional. I was reading one commentator that said the Apostle John wrote everything up to chapter 20, verse 3, and then the Apostle John died, and one of his ignorant disciples found some of his notes and wrote the rest of it. <laughs> well, well, that shows us a problem here, doesn't it? Now, and he uh, hurled him into the abyss and closed it and sealed it over him. And that's the idea of a very uh, uh, specific binding. Uh, to keep him from leading the nations astray anymore. And there's the very specific thing that he's trying to do. If you go back to chapter 12, verse 9, and chapter 13, verse 11 through 14, you see the problem here. Now, this idea of leading the nations astray is exactly what's going to happen a little later when Satan's let loose for a little while. Exactly why he's let loose, I don't know. Who exactly these nations are, I'm not sure. Because back in chapter 19, they were supposedly all thrown into the lake of fire, I mean killed, uh, along with the, the idea of the beast being overthrown, the Antichrist. 
Some say, well, it's the nations who weren't involved in the Antichrist uh, system. Others say it's the remnant of those nations. The army was destroyed, but the nation still existed. I don't know. There's going to be even nations uh, in chapter 21 and 22 when there shouldn't be any nations at all because all that should be there is the redeemed. I just don't know. Some, some questions are very hard to answer through here. Now it says, and he couldn't you know, lead him astray for a thousand years at end, and then he must, it's that word dia, moral necessity, be loosed for a little while. Exactly why? We're not sure. Some say it's to give man a, a chance uh, for an option. Some say that this is the way that God's going to show that he has been just and faithful in judging man because man, even in a perfect environment of the Messiah reigning a thousand years, still is going to rebel against him at the end. Uh, that's the best I can, can know. Verse 4, Then I saw thrones. This is obvious allusion, Daniel 7, verse 9. Now, in the book of Revelation, most thrones relate to, the, uh, to Satan or the beast. And those who were seated on them, this goes back to Daniel 7, 22, and permission was granted them to pass judgment. Now, some say this refers to reign, to reign with Christ, and some say justice was given to them. Now, the real fight in verse 4 is how many groups are there? Some see three groups in verse 4. Some see two groups in verse 4, and some see just martyrs. Well, I don't think there's any scriptural evidence for a martyr's reign only because there are many passages that talk about that all of us will reign with Christ. Here is just some of them about an all-saints reign. Matthew 19, 28, Luke 22, 30, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 8, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 12, Revelation 3, 21, 5, 10, uh, and on and on. There's an eternal reign of saints mentioned in 22.5. So this reign of martyrs doesn't fulfill the other scripture. When are they going to reign? That's why I'm not sure. I personally see two groups. And the place I see the second group is down where it says, who refused to worship the wild beast. The Greek construction here allows for another group. And I think it's those who didn't worship the wild beast, but they weren't killed by the wild beast. They died a natural death, but they still uh, did not prostitute themselves to beast worship. So I particularly see two groups. Now, notice it says the word beheaded means beheaded with an axe, two-edged axe, which was how people were capital uh, punished in the early Republic of Rome, though later it was a different way. And bearing testimony to Jesus. You might want to see Revelation 1, 9, Revelation 14, 9 uh, for different places that's used. Now, notice it says... Um, they did not have the stamp, that goes back to Revelation 13, 16, and 17, upon their foreheads and upon their hands. And they lived and reigned to Christ a thousand years. Now the word they lived is the, one of the normal words for resurrection. I don't think you can get any way around it. It's a spiritual resurrection here. I think it's got to be a physical resurrection in verse 4 if it's going to be a physical resurrection in verse 5. Now here's some places where it's used a physical resurrection. Uh, Matthew 9, 18, uh, Acts 1, 3, and then uh, 9 and following, John 4.25, Romans 14.9, Revelation 1.18, 2.8, and 13.14, the same words used for all uh, of these different um, physical resurrections. So I think we've got to say that. Uh, now it says, and the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were ended. Now here's the question. Is it all saints that participate in the millennial reign of Christ or just some saints? Same as saints who were martyred in John's day, saints who are martyred in every day. Saints and believers in John's day are all saints everywhere. Because it seemed the second coming was back in chapter 19. If it's chronological, all the saints ought to be reigning with Christ. Uh, if so, then all the believers participate in the first resurrection and then only the lost participate in the second. Well, that's a possibility. But this is the only place I know of where it talks about two uh, resurrections. To me, Daniel 12, 2, uh, John 5, 28 and 29, and Acts 24, uh, 15 all talk about one a resurrection. And there are many more passages I put in your notes that I think really teach one resurrection. So this is a brand new truth, and it's in a symbolic passage, so I'm not sure how we deal with it. Notice it says, Blessed and holy is the man who shares in the first resurrection. Well, I, I wonder how... Uh, uh, dispensational priests deal with this when they have a secret rapture earlier that supposedly all the saints receive their bodies, which they say is Matthew, I mean, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. If that's true, how can this be the first resurrection? It seems to be the second. I think all the systems have problems with the first and second resurrection. Now, notice where it says, and they will be priests of God in Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. Now, this priest of God goes back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and chapter 5, verse 10, where the titles for the Old Testament people of God, coming from Exodus 19, 5, and 6, are applied to the church. The same truth can be seen in 1 
Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and 9. And so they reign with him. And verse, chapter 5, verse 10 seems to be all saints, not just the martyrs, a thousand years. And when the thousand years has ended, now the word when means whenever, which is kind of an ambiguous phrase in Greek, which seems to imply maybe the thousand years are not meant to be taken literally. Satan will be loosed. It's future passive, which means God's going to let him loose. It's going to be a purpose in it. Uh, from his prison, and he will go forth to lead astray the nations. It's amazing to me that people who have been with Christ for a thousand years, seen his rules, known him, are going to be sucked off by the false views of the evil one. That's amazing to me. It's also amazing to me that these resurrected saints are going to be mixed with people who have a, still have apparently a, a potential toward sin. I don't see how that's all going to fit. It's a mystery. That's why I'm not so certain that taking this literally is always the best way to interpret it. Now, uh, and he will lead them astray, the nations that are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Now, this goes back to Ezekiel 38 and 39. I really think the background to this whole chapter is Ezekiel 36 through the, through the, the, the 48, really. Now, in 36, the people of God are brought back to the land. There's a resurrection in 37 of the national Israel. And then in an eschatological setting, the, the God's people are still attacked by evil. That's what Gog and Magog is of, of Ezekiel 38 and 39. It came to be used by the rabbis is of the enemies of God's people. Now, originally, uh, Magog is a land of which Gog comes out of. But here, they're both personified as two evil enemies, which is the usage of rabbinical Judaism. And they muster them for battle. That's much like the, like the frogs did, the evil demonic frogs are, uh, in an earlier lesson. Um, and their number would be the sands of the sea. Isn't that interesting? That's one of the promises to Abraham back in Genesis 15:5, 22:17, and 32:12. It's repeated in Hebrews 11:12. It's again the mimicking of um, evil to God's people in promise. And they came to a, a, a broad plain of the earth. Now, some interpret this as being they're going to fight on a plain, much like we saw back in chapter 16, verse 16, with the battle of Armageddon. Or some say it means just a large army that covered uh, the land, that kind of idea. Um, and surrounded the camp of God's people. This may be a camp in the sense of the wilderness wandering idea or an army camp. Now, what is the beloved city? Well, some say it's got to be obviously used for Jerusalem. Yeah, but the usage throughout the book of the Revelation has been the idea of a heavenly city of God and an earthly anti-God city. So though it seems to be Revelation here, I think just like back in chapter 11, verse 8, I personally am going to make it this heavenly uh, Jerusalem versus the physical end-time anti-God world system. Then fire came down from heaven, that's Ezekiel 38, 22 and 39, 6, and consumed them. You might want to see Luke 21, 20. Uh, then the devil who had led astray was hurled in the lake of fire. This idea of evil being thrown in the lake of fire, we saw back in chapter 19, 20, that the beast and the false prophet. Now here in 2010, Satan's thrown in the lake of fire. A little later on, uh, in 10, 14, death and Hades are going to be thrown in the lake of fire. And then in verse 15, all the lost, mankind's going to be thrown in the lake of fire. The lake of fire is synonymous with Gehenna. It stands for eternal separation and punishment. It's now the ideal of fire, which is common to some, to some uh, Jewish apocalyptic books, but also the stinking smell of burning sulfur is also caught up in this. What a wild beast and the false prophet were. And they were to be tortured day and night forever and ever. Now there's a very similar metaphor like this in chapter 14, 10 and 11, and chapter 19, 5, and you might want to look that up. The idea of forever and ever goes back to Matthew 25, 46, where heaven is described as eternal, and also the separation from God is described uh, as eternal. Now, here comes the judgment day. Then I saw the great white throne and him who was seated on it. Now, the problem with this is, how does this relate to what, what seems to be a parallel passage, Matthew 25, 31 through 46? Because in that passage, the nations are separating the sheep and the goats. In that judgment, there's the lost and the saved together. If you believe that the, all the saved were resurrected the first resurrection before the millennium, this, this judgment after the millennium only can be the lost. But then it's not a parallel. Um, and so there's real questions about who is involved here. Now, who is it that sits on the throne? Well, in several passages, it seems that God has given judgment over to Christ, particularly John 5:22. And in your notes, I've mis listed several more. In other passages in John, it says that, that Jesus doesn't judge anybody. Uh, John 3, 17 through 21. Uh, John 12, 47 and 48. And so the idea here is that 
Jesus is the judge for God. But in, really, in reality, Jesus came not to judge, but to save. But the fact that men refuse to trust him, they judge themselves by what they do with the Son. In many passages, it is God who's on the throne, particularly in the book of the Revelation, over and over again, and also in Romans 14.10. But in some passages, it seems to refer to Christ. In your notes, I've given you an extensive outline of this particular element. And from whose presence earth and sky fled away, and uh, no more to be. Now this idea about earth fell away, some say this is all things become new. And so they would see this in the, in the sense of the physical realm sharing the curse of the fall of man, Romans 8, 14 through 22. Others say it refers to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, where all of the physical elements are going to be burned up and we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. And that's the idea of Revelation 21 and 22. When it says no more room was found for them, this is very similar to the phrase found in chapter 12, verse 8, which speaks of evil. And verse 12, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Now who are these? Are they the lost only? Are they both groups? I just can't answer that. And matter of fact, many, many people have already interpreted this chapter before they ever get to it because of the system that they're pre-committed to. There is much ambiguity here, and people kind of interpret the ambiguity away. I've been amazed in reading through this at how dogmatic some of these commentators are. They kind of let you, uh, the way they write, that everybody but them is a dummy. And if you don't agree what they agree, there's something wrong with your spirituality. Well, that is just totally inappropriate when many godly Bible-believing commentators interpret this chapter radically different as they do the whole book of the Revelation. Now, that is surprising because obviously God is trying to tell us something, and I don't think he was trying to get us so mad at each other we can't even sit down in fellowship. Obviously, I think the central truth is a sovereignty of God in human history, which really had a word to the first century persecuted Christians and to every generation. I do think there's truth here, but I'm not sure we can take it literally and chronologically when it's of a literary genre known as apocalyptic prophetic literature. Now, and here's the great and small. We've seen that phrase, great and small, several times in the book of the Revelation. And the books were open. Now, this book seems to go back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 10 again. There are two books mentioned, the book of life and the book of remembrances. In your notes, I've given you a list of where all those are found because we've, we've listed them earlier in our study. Matter of fact, it was back in chapter 3, uh, verse 5, where we talked about the book of life first. It's mentioned several times in the book of the Revelation. And this idea of the books of God is also a current in apocalyptic Judaism. Enoch chapter 90, verse 20, uh, 4 Ezra chapter 6, verse 20, and Baruch 24, 1. Now, then it says, And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, and accords what they had done. It's not the idea there that they were saved by their works, but it's obvious that judgment is on two grounds. Number one, is their name in the Lamb's book of life? That's verse 15. But the other side is, because they are saved, they're going to live a certain way. That seems to be the truth to me of Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, particularly 10 that we sometimes leave out, that good works are in the will of God. Now, this good works has been something we've mentioned over and over again in the Bible. Jeremiah 17, 10, Matthew 16, 27, Matthew 25, 31 and following, Revelation 2, 23, and Revelation here, 20, 13. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, death, and, un, and really it's Hades gave up the dead. That's not three different places. It's just a way of saying all the dead were there. And, and they were all judged in accordance with what they had done. And then death, which we found back in chapter 1, verse 18, and Hades, which we found also in chapter 6, verse 8, which is the holding place of the dead, synopsis shield, were hurled in the lake of fire. It's obviously symbolic here. We've got uh, death and Hades personified and thrown into a fiery lake. Now, we're in the, we're in the area of symbols. People say, well, this Revelation 20 must be taken literally because there's nothing symbolic in it. What about the binding of Satan with a chain and throwing him in a pit? What about death and hell being personified? This is obviously a book that has many symbols. My friends, I have prayed so about this, this study, and I must say the more I read and the more I study, the more confused I get. When I go back and read the simple structure of the Bible, I don't get all the elaborate systems of men and denominational positions. 
I think the book of the Revelation is not that hard to interpret, but we're trying to make it say too much. We want too much information. I think we've got to say God's in control of history. He is coming back for his saints. There is going to be justice. Wickedness is going to be overthrown. I certainly believe in an end-time antichrist. I certainly believe in a visible return of the Lord. But I'm not sure of all the events. I'm kind of I'm kind of a historical pre without a program. And I get more and more nervous when people say, well, I've got it all worked out, and here's 15 sheets of detailed outline. Oh, my. We are in an apocalyptic book. It is obvious. We've got dragons and women being having children in the sky and stars falling and all... We're in an apocalyptic, symbolic passage. I have interpreted the rest of the book of Revelation in, I believe, a struggle between God and the evil one. I've seen the church throughout the book of Revelation. I don't share the dispensationalist presupposition that Israel and the church are totally separate and that all prophecies have to be literally fulfilled to Israel. I don't believe that. I have seen the church throughout. I believe this is another symbolic representation of truth to help the hurting Christians of the first century and also to help the hurting Christians of every age to ensure within us the hope that Jesus is coming for us and anyone who trusts him can go with him. And God help us all when I read chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. God help us. I don't want my have the plagues, the book of Revelation, and I sure don't want my name taken out of the book of life because I misinterpreted this. So I pray for grace, do the best that I can, and hope that some of the details have been helpful to you. God bless you, and I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week.